Tim Saturno. Go it. Go for it. Mike, thank you so much. Carol, You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm in my studio here in Jersey City. Uh, my painting career is actually, um, I, I started late in life. Uh, I, I ended my theater career in about 2006 and then started painting seriously then. Um, and I, I've been very lucky. I, it, I've had I've some nice, uh, nice notice and such. Um, I think what I love about the organizations that I'm involved in is, uh, you know, painting is a lonely, a lonely job. You know, we're alone most of the time. So I find the societies and different uh, exhibits that have the work a great time to meet other artists and to talk. So I uh, thank you for inviting me. No, uh, you're very welcome. Happy to have you. I, I, I told the board <laughs> earlier that I'm actually from Oswego, New York. So I'm an upstate boy myself. So it's nice to be invited by you guys. Um, you know, I the fact that I was a theater designer and a film designer has really influenced what I like to paint, what I find interesting to paint. Uh, you could look at my work and kind of call them a lot of um, uh, set designs, actually, or location studies for movies. Uh, and primarily New York City. I, I don't get tired of painting New York City at all. So um, that's been most of, my, most of my career. I've branched out in the last few years uh, doing some paintings in Southern California, specifically Joshua Tree, actually the town of Joshua Tree outside the park and up in Provincetown, which I'd love to spend summers up in Provincetown. So I've been doing a lot of, a lot of watercolors of the buildings of Provincetown. So that's fun. Um, tonight we're gonna do this painting here. And Carol, I don't know if, if people can pin this but if you want to fill your screen with just my, with just this view, which says Tim on it. Okay. Is that possible? I can, yep. Ah. Give me just a second. There you go. Okay. Does that fill the screen? Yeah. Okay. Hold on a second. There we go. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, this is what I'm going to attempt tonight. Uh, this is a deli in uh, an area just uh, on the East River called Long Island City. So it's right across the Queensboro Bridge from Manhattan. And uh, it's a very industrial part of New York City. Um, and they have that, the, the wonderful elevated tracks out in Long Island City. And I was walking around and saw this. And what, what I look for when I look for a painting is value patterns, value patterns. I like to see how the sun, the sunlight and the shadows make shapes. I'm less interested in the details and I'm mostly interested in the shapes of the light and the dark. Um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on this one so you can sort of see it a little bit better. There we go. So, um, the first thing I do with this photograph is actually I turn it into a um, value study. So this is the first thing I do. Kind of zoom in and out here. Um, where I take, I, it's, it's very simple actually. I just take a piece of trace paper, put it on top of my research, and I just draw out the shadow shapes and the light shapes. I try not to put in any detail. And it's really just two values. It's the white paper and the dark, dark pencil. <clears throat> and if I, if I find that this drawing of mine, if this is something I find exciting, then I know that the finished watercolor will be exciting. Uh, if, if it works at this stage as just a value pattern, um, then I know that the, I know I have a good shot. And I tend to paint rather large. My paintings are uh, usually about 40 by 26 inches, what's known as single elephant size watercolor paper. So I tend to paint very large. They take a bit of time. I want to make sure that this is something that I'm going to be excited about. Um, and I'm just, I'm going to go through now with you folks, my sort of step by step as I develop a painting. So I have my research here and I have my value study and the value study I'll keep right next to me as I paint to remind me to keep 
this idea throughout the painting. Um, I think I, if, if I have one argument with a lot of watercolor teaching is that I find a lot of watercolor too pale. It's just pale. Uh, watercolor as a medium tends to verge on pale because when it dries, it's always lighter. And um, a lot of my paintings just really push the idea of, um, of darkness, really, of darkness. So the first thing I'll do, and I'm going to zoom out again on this thing. Trying. There we go. So I want to show you the table. I'll take, I'll take my research and I will grid it up. If you can see that on top of this photograph, I've drawn a grid. Mm -hmm. And this is how I blow up my paintings. So I'll take this grid and I'll duplicate the grid on a piece of paper. And this is the painting gridded up. Um, so, I, so this is the size that I'll be painting tonight. So I think you can see, as I hold it up to you, um, the grid sits on top and I figure out all the drawings here. Uh, there was an exhibit, boy, uh, 40 years ago um, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they had one of the um, Michelangelo cartoons, one of his sketches for the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Uh, a cartoon is, is usually meant to be a chalk drawing uh, of the scale that it's gonna do. And what, of course, he was working with wet plaster, he had to work very quickly. So what he did is he drew it all on paper first. And then they took a, um, they took a pounce wheel, which is a wheel that makes little holes in the paper. And through all the lines, he did little dotted holes with this pounce wheel. And then you put it up on the ceiling and rub charcoal on top of the paper, pull the paper, and then the outline of the drawing would be on the wet plaster. So he could transfer that drawing quickly. But what amazed me about that cartoon was there was a grid on the cartoon. So he started with a much smaller sketch and then to blow it up for the scale of the Sistine Chapel, he gridded it up. And that's the, that's the technique I use here. Um, I'm not sure what people like to do in terms of, of drawing. I tend to be a little, uh, Carl, Carol will understand, a little architectural. So I want, the, I want it to be accurate as I do. So I take this and then I simply transfer it to my watercolor paper which is this here. What size is that sheet, Tim? Uh, this is a quarter sheet. So we're, we're gonna paint with, um, uh, what is it? Uh, tw 22 by 15, 22 by 15 tonight. Okay. And is that arches or one of the arches, other? Arches, yeah. I, I tend to only use arches, um, arches paper, uh, primarily Windsor Newton paints. Although I do have a fondness for some beautiful uh, paint from Daniel Smith out in Seattle and a couple from Old Holland, if you know Old Holland watercolors. They have some beautiful color within that, old, old fashioned watercolors. <coughs> um, I love Daniel Smith. Uh, different texture, different consistency of paint. Daniel Smith uses um, honey, honey as his binder. So the, the actual paint itself has a whole different whole different texture. Uh, it's, it's, it has a different fluidity than Windsor Newton. Windsor Newton uses primarily something called gum Arabic, which is a sap of a tree that they use to sort of hold the paint together. Um, so great. So the, uh, and this is how, how I teach my, my, um, my workshops. And I'm gonna just set up my paints here. I tend to paint out of these uh, corral little salad bowls. Um, I paint large, so each of my colors are in different bowls, and I'll show you the range of them as we as we go here. Um, I also want to show you another thing that I use. Oh. Oop. You be Sorry about that. I'll come back. <laughs> I'll come back uh, if I can. There we go. Okay, am I back? I am back. Sorry about that. Whoops, lost your hand. Hmm. 
You were going from vertical to horizontal. And okay, this is it then. Sorry about that, folks. I'm I'm using as my as my desk camera my iPhone. Uh, I find it's a very good camera, but if someone calls me, it cuts out. So I apologize. <laughs> so this is my this is my color uh, my color um, sort of sheet that I put all my colors in. Uh, I need to see the color in front of me. I need to see what the color looks like actually on the arches paper. And if you notice, I've, I've sort of lifted out a line in each of these color samples. And what that tells me is the staining quality of the paint itself. Um, you know, it tells you on the, on the tube, which I cannot read, it's too small, but it tells you on the tube what the staining quality of the, of the paint is. Um, I don't believe it. I want to see it, what happens on paper. Mm -hmm. And if I can lift it up, I know that, I know that what kind of staining quality it has. Um, you know, like for instance, this cad yellow here really lifts up beautifully, but this cad orange over here is staining the paper as, in a, as is a number of these reds. So this is just my quick reference in terms of the different colors that I use. Okay. Um, the traditional way of painting watercolor is um, start with the lightest and you paint like your sky, lightest, lightest sky. And then on top of that, a little darker, you'll put your mountains. And then on top of that, a little darker, you'll put your trees. And that's how you sort of build up. That's a traditional way of building up a watercolor. Um, I break all the rules and I start with the darkest dark. So I am going to dive in with my darkest dark. Now, what I'm going to do first here is I'm going to paint what's known as a grisaille, a grisaille underpainting. Grisaille is a fancy French word that basically means gray. Uh, this is a very old fashioned technique for painting with translucent paints. And it was really developed by Van Eyck and uh, Leonardo da Vinci when, when oil paint became uh, usable in the uh, 15th century. It's an underpainting of value. So I'm going to go in into this painting and I'm just going to paint value, the darkest value that I can. What are you using in terms of color? So this is Payne's gray. Okay. And you have a small brush. Yeah, for this, it's, it's small. I think it'll be smarter if I use my larger one for this. <laughs> but I'll go in and I'll paint the darkest I can. And what I also will do is I'm constantly turning this so that I am painting into the lines so I can see the lines. I wanna show you how to make a straight line. So there's a dark line here. And look at this beautiful, this is what a one inch flat brush. And I'm gonna make a beautiful line right here. And I'm gonna make a very thin line. But what I'm doing is all the weight is on my the pad of my hand. So I'm actually, pressing down on the pad and moving my entire arm. And this way I can go in and make these beautiful straight lines with this rather big brush. There's a bunch of lines over here. I'm gonna flip my paper so I can cut right into this.
Yeah, it is. I also paint up on an easel. I don't usually paint down on the table. Uh, because I paint all day, I find that it's easier on my back if I'm standing up. But I haven't figured out how to do a good Zoom presentation up on the easel. Um, there was an exhibit, I'm, I'm going to the museums constantly, so I'm going to talk about museums a lot. Uh, two years ago, a painting of um, uh, Leonardo's came over from the Uffizi in Florence, and it was his painting of St. Jerome. Uh, and it's unfinished. He never finished it. He didn't finish a lot. And this one, he really didn't finish. And what was amazing about it, it was, um, you could see his underpainting. It was all um, warm underpainting. He, paint, he underpaint with sepia browns. So what you saw was just a brown painting, but it was all the value painted first in a warm brown and so this is kind of this is totally old fashioned Sketch that you have, sketch painting that you have to your up your left. That's that's different from the the value study that you did. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is the once again my value study is right here. We can't. What is that? What is that one that you have in the upper left? I'm curious. Um, you're gonna find out soon. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't want to give I don't want to give away all, all my tricks yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Carol, you're too observant. Yeah. And I will go through this rather pedantically, painting all of these dark, dark areas in my paints gray. And I love this Windsor Newton color because it, it has such a beautiful quality it's not a it's not a boring gray it's actually made up of prussian blue black and a little bit of scarlet red get this sort of gorgeous thing Definitely an architect's painting that you're doing. Yes, exactly. And I'm not the only retired architect who's sitting here watching you. David Gardner from Rochester is also observing, probably finds this interesting, right, David? There's a lot of great watercolor painters out there who are architects. Um, mostly because, you know, in the theater, this is, this is what I learned to, to sketch with, is, is watercolor. It's quick, and it can show beautiful atmospheric and light qualities. Now, of course, you're all sitting there going, 
Oh my God, is it gonna paint blue all night? <laughs> Kill me now. Um, now I'll come back in with a little bit of water because I wanna make this below this just a bit of a, a wash. So I'm gonna take my, just a little bit of water and just run it along the bottom here and draw that blue color down into this. And I'm sort of just drawing down that paint from above. I just want a little bit of tone in that area there. And this, this area above here is also just toned. It's not as dark. So I'm gonna quickly just put in, once again, I'm really pushing on my hand and then just dragging my paintbrush And because I paint so much architecture, I primarily use flat brushes. I kind of marvel at other watercolor painters who do everything with, um, with round brushes. But these flat brushes are so good to make these straight lines. <laughs> A little bit darker here. So I will continue painting. this beautiful dark Payne's gray. And here I'll go back in with just a little bit of water just to draw this down. Is this cold press or hot press? Rough. They're actually, no, this, this is cold press. Okay. Cold press. Hot press paper is wonderful for illustration and ink work, but for watercolor paint, it's very unforgiving. Meaning you can't, I find it very difficult to lift up from, from um, hot press paper. The cold press and the rough paper are so much more forgiving. I gotta make sure I stay on camera here. Such a beautiful, rich, dark. Tim, I have to ask you, do you use white 
Yes. Okay. But and I'll show you after this. I'll show you, I'll show you how, how I use my white. Okay. Which is probably not the way you think white should be used. <laughs> well, I don't use white, so whatever you do is fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, in New York, uh, I use the white paint for atmosphere. I'll have to dig up. Um, I don't use it a lot, but it's usually quite um, it's quite <laughs> for overpainting. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So are you self-taught or did you take watercolor classes? And You know, uh, throughout my theater career, I have to say that I was mostly self-taught. Um, I went to a school where they didn't teach painting. They sort of thought that you should just know it before you come to school, which is very, <laughs> very stupid. Um, so what I did, you know, to begin painting, I, I copied painters that I loved. And in the theater world, there's some beautiful um, designers who paint beautifully in watercolor. Um, and I just, I copied them. It's like, oh, that's cool. I'll try that. You know, in the in the theater and film business, I would have to change my painting technique to kind of match whatever show I was designing. It had to look a certain way, an opera different than a Broadway <laughs> musical, a, a straight play, a drama different than a comedy. So I would be constantly kind of reinventing my painting technique to um, to match the tone and the feeling of whatever play I was designing. And I, I, I love that. I think it gave me a great education in, um, I don't know, fluidity. <laughs> I think I love watercolor because it is so expressive. It can, it can really be a, a number of different, uh, create a number of different moods and feelings just through the paint. Okay. Well, you sort of got the idea here where I'm painting, 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 painting. And this is the majority of my painting. All the work is really in this level. I'll zoom in a little bit so you guys can see what I'm doing here. There we go. It doesn't look like much right now. It's actually the underneath of that elevated subway. Um, and I, uh, Carol's already, already sort of um, caught what I'm gonna do next. But after painting many hours, I kind of get to here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so let me just put this down here, there we go. Um, so after many hours, this is sort of, what it is, and I'll, I'll zoom in again so you guys can see a little bit more of this detail. So I was painting just the underneath of that railroad carriage. You can see the, the stoplights. And then as I got down here, I started painting not the darkest darks, but different tones of the gray. I'm gonna continue this one with lighter tones of my color. Um, and so this is this, if you remember this beautiful, I think what, what really grabbed me about this was this beautiful sh uh, shadow shape, this, um, this triangle, which is in such opposition to all the other sort of rectilinear pieces of this. So I'm gonna put in this shadow here quite, quite lightly. As you can see, the shadow goes right over 
the sign below it. And I'm not, I'm not losing anything on the sign. Now, there's some lines up here, which are the um, railings of the subway above. I'm just going to block those in. I want to go back to my research to see exactly what I'm doing here. So you call your the photograph your research? Yeah, that's a, a theater term. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I have a couple of very thin lines here. I'm going to show you some of my favorite brushes. My favorite expensive brushes. Um, these are, I'll put a piece of white paper here so you can see them. Okay. These are what's known as riggers. Look at this, look at the different shapes. This is one from France. Um, isn't that a great shape? And what I know about this is it's going to hold a lot of paint because the well of the brush is here. And yet where the paint comes out is going to be incredibly narrow, thin. There is this one here, which is called a dagger. Mm -hmm. Same thing. The, the paint's going to be stored back here, but the point is literally one or two hairs. This is the type of brush they use to do those beautiful detailing on what cars on the 50s from the 50s and 60s, I guess, when they were detailing cars, they would use this particular sign brush known as a dagger. The one I'm going to use here is this beautiful brush from Rosemary. And as I put it in water, you can really see the beautiful point I get with this rigor. Rosemary Brushes is a company out of London. And I love them because the woman who ran it, who owns the company and makes a lot of the brushes, uh, found herself divorced and not knowing what she was going to do. So she started this all woman company of brush makers. And I must say the quality of their brushes is just excellent. I'm gonna pull in a little bit closer. There is a wire here. I don't know if you can see it in the paper but there's a wire that sort of comes across there. Now, this, to use a rigger is, um, I, think, I think you'd call it a leap of faith. I'm gonna have one chance to draw this and it's gotta be done right. Now I'm actually holding the brush differently. I'm kind of holding it like this. So the brush is really gonna be perpendicular to the paper. And I'm gonna be careful that the brush, that my paper, that it's going to move in a certain way that is clear with my arm. It's, it's difficult to paint this way. You know, I'm just, I'm gonna do it the way my, my body works best. So I'm gonna fill up that rigor and I'm gonna paint in that line. Let's see how I do. There we go, not bad, not bad. So that's where I use my rigor. I'm also gonna use it down here in this part. I'm gonna make sure my paint is the right consistency. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And this is another piece of wire that just is just a shadow. So do you ever change the um, something in the photograph that you don't like? I mean, are you always, do you not take the photograph until you're sure that's exactly what you want to paint? Who is, who is asking this question? My name's Susie Stevenson. I'm in Chicago. Susie, very good. Um, I move everything in a painting. I change it constantly in terms of composition. Uh, okay. This one, this one's pretty good. I didn't. I, not, I'm not going to change a lot in this uh, from the photograph, but I will move around cars, and especially telephone poles, 
and traffic poles, anything to improve the composition of the painting. Okay. Now, sometimes I'll just do this in the drawing and sometimes I'll do it in the research through Photoshop and I'll get the, I'll get the drawing, my research uh, photograph to look the way I want it to. Um, but yes, uh, as I tell my students, we are not here to duplicate photographs. We are here to make good paintings. Thank you. You're welcome. And besides, you know, no one is ever going to put your painting up next to your research. There we go. And now we're going to do the street down here. And the street is um, sort of a pale, a pale gray. It's got to have a little bit of value to it because it's going to show up all of these beautiful white stripes of the walk crosswalk. So here I'm using my large brush again. When you're used doing work on an easel, how do you, you must have a, a little different approach when you're making your straight lines. Or you're no, same thing. I actually find it much easier to paint a straight line standing up than <laughs> I do it on the table. But you're maybe I'm just been painting your up. 70s. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's pretty impressive to me. <laughs> Once again, I'm pushing down on my hand. And that's what's really controlling the brush, not my wrist and not my fingers. Thank you. I don't want to paint off the screen. Tell me if I disappear like that. My brushes um, are also, this, this brush that I'm using, it's such a great brush and it was cheap. It's called Dynasty and they sell them by the bucket load at Blick. And I bought them once for a workshop and I just, I've fallen in love with them. They are not expensive brushes, but boy, are they good. My parents bought me what? A Winsor Newton series seven paintbrush when I was in college, a number eight. Series seven. Uh, at that time, it was about seventy dollars, uh -huh. and I was too afraid to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. It's almost new. So as you can see, as I'm painting, this is called, of course, negative painting. So I'm painting the negative space. So that the lighter area will become the positive shape. So do you actually teach watercolor classes or? I do. Where, whereabouts in your, out of your house? Or? I teach at the Art Students League here on 57th Street. Ah. And I love doing workshops at the Art Students League. It's such a, such a great school. It's where Edward Hopper went. <laughs> um, are people familiar with the Art Students League? Yeah. 
Yes. It's one of those wonderful old, it's now the- It's been there forever. Been there forever. Uh, back in the day, colleges, you did not go to college to get an art degree. Colleges did not think art was worthy of a college degree. So there were basically trade schools set up to become an artist or an illustrator. You know, Edward Hopper was an illustrator. Yes. Norman Rockwell, of course, who also went to the art <clears throat> school. Um, just a few years ago, the National Academy closed. Um, so there you can see how I'm just bringing out that, um, that those white lines that come across this road. Um, this is the best thing I've ever bought which is called a heated gun. It's not a hair dryer. It's a heat gun. And it's so quiet. It's great. When I went to college there, the year before I got there, there wasn't any art major. It was only art history. And yeah. they decided to divide it into art history and studio art. <laughs> And my mom went to Rochester Institute of Technology. Fine. And, you know, it was a school of technology. Yep. She learned how to be an illustrator there. I did. She did. Actually, she, my mom was a commercial artist. Um, it's fun. Her portfolio was like, you know, she used to draw the cows on the outside of milk cartons and stuff. <laughs> So I guess I've been around painters for a while here. I'm painting in this sort of dark cast shadow right on top of the street that I just painted. Okay. Takes me a minute. I'm, I need to see what I'm doing here. It's a little nerve wracking painting in front of people. But you've been a very good quiet audience so far. Anyone, anyone have any questions? No, this is spellbinding. <laughs> you are very kind. Yeah, but I'll be finished with this in just a second if I can see what more I have to do here. This one. I don't have a question, but I see you're demonstrating for NWS this Saturday morning. I am. <laughs> for members, today's the last day to register for it. <laughs> I am, I am, uh, my February has become very busy. <laughs> um. <laughs> Okay, this is pretty. I'm gonna pull out the camera just a little bit so you can see a little bit more of this. There we go. There we go. This is my grisaille layer. Um, and this is this is this is a lot of work, as you can as you can imagine. Painting all this takes a while. Um, I'm just gonna flatten this down a little bit. Now the next part is the most fun. And a little story before I do this, so not, not to shock the children. Um, <laughs> I studied, I did study, I did take art. When I, when I decided to leave teaching, I was teaching at UConn, University of Connecticut, theater, theater design. When I went to New York, the first thing I did was I went to the Art Students League and 
became a student again, which is such a cool thing for a professor to do. Um, and I studied with a painter named Paul Chingbor. Once again, Paul, C-H-I-N-G dash B-O-R, Paul Chingbor. Take a look at his work. It will, it's so different. And he is all about throwing paint, throwing paint, but not in the way of a Jackson Pollock. He does layers and layers of very translucent watercolor. And what he creates is just magic. So I studied with this guy and I was just, I was amazed that you could actually get away with throwing paint. Um, his technique is, is throwing layers and layers of white paint. This is for Mike. Um, so that it's a, uh, you know, the Chinese white and the titanium white are, are, are a little opaque. They're opaque color. But if you do it light enough, it really just becomes these layers of, of this white. Now, what I'm going to do now is what I, I, I didn't, I, I, I kind of changed what he was teaching me. I didn't want to throw white paint. So I, I experimented and I just threw paint water like this. And what's neat about this is watercolor runs. I'm going to I'm going to put in a little bit of paint into my brush and throw this. That's the grit. This is the grit. <clears throat> and I'm literally look at I'm using a brush that you can get at hardware stores. I think this was 50 cents. And they're called chip brushes. Chip, C-H-I-P, chip brushes. And they come in all these different sizes. You'll find them in the paint department, but they're, they're, they're for carpenters to put on like glue and plaster. And here I'm just using these. What's great about it is they don't hold paint very well. So they're wonderful to throw with this. I want to be careful. I, I overthrew a little bit. I want to kind of soak up the water here. Now that is, that to me becomes quite exciting. This is cool. It kind of, what it does, it kind of takes the, it takes the uh, hard edge off right? It, it takes the hard edge off. Um, the other color I'm going to put on top, if I can find it, hold on, let me look through my drawers. Here it is. My burnt sienna. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to do what I call one of my counterpoints. I'm gonna bring some clean water out here. I'm just gonna make a soup of this wonderful warm color. And I'm gonna also spatter this with this warm color. You're making me smile. <laughs> this is very freeing. Very non-architectural. <laughs> very indeed. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take the brush, I'm gonna sort of move this around. And I love where this, where this warm color is, mixes in with the blue color. When you started painting watercolor, when you were painting as a painter, as opposed to a set designer, is this the kind of thing you did or is this something you've come up with more recently? You know, I, 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 I took class at the Art Students League for two years. And since Paul was all about freeing up watercolor, this is gonna take a minute, so I'll get to talk a little bit. Um, it, it amazed me uh, and uh, None, you know, I've never painted kind of a, a tight watercolor since. 
even though when I was in the theater and film, I had to paint very realistic, very representational um, sketches of what the set was going to look like. So this is gonna take a minute just to dry here. Any questions so far? You're doing fine. Okay. How's our time? We're at eight o'clock now. We're gonna go on to, we have until nine o'clock, right? Yes. Yes. Now these colors that I've done, you could do a grisaille with any color you want, really. Any color you want. Uh, when I did my Southern California paintings, I was out in the desert, the high desert. Payne's gray didn't seem like the right tone. So all of my paintings from my Joshua Tree series, <laughs> the underpainting was all done in browns, sepias and Van Dyke browns. Um, in Italian, it's, I'm gonna pronounce it incorrectly. Uh, Bruel, no, I think that's a t uh, French. Bruel, which is sort of a brown underpainting. Anyone speak Italian? <laughs> Um, and then these, these splashes of color that I put on it is whatever color I've used as my grisaille color, in this case, Payne's gray, and really any other color that you wish. I tend to like to use a contrasting warm with the cool of the blues. This is going to take a minute. Now, normally what I do is after I splash this, I go to bed. <laughs> I just leave it. I just leave it on the floor and see what it looks like tomorrow morning. So for this, I'm actually going to speed up the drying a little bit. I'm going to go in and suck up some of the water puddles here. I don't usually do this, but for the demo, I want to sort of speed this up a bit and I can see where there's puddles of color. I don't use paper towels. I use old t-shirts. Why don't you use paper towels? I don't want to waste the paper. Okay. Um, also, you need to be very careful. If your paper towels have a texture, mm -hmm you might transfer that texture onto your painting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and when these get really dirty, I just throw them out. in the wash. Oh dear. And have lovely semi-clean cloth. I mean, I paint, I'm really lucky. I, I paint every day. Um, So I've got to sort of figure out, you know, paper towels get expensive, right? Okay, this is drying well. Do a little clean up around the painting. It's also good painting in this weather, it's very dry out. I tried painting in Florida and I gotta tell you, nothing dries in Florida. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, this is good. Tim, once again, please, the name of that dryer that you're using, I never heard of it. It's called Heat It by Granger. Uh, Granger, G-R-A-N-G-E-R, -E Heat It Craft Tool. Dick Blick sells them, I think they're 16 bucks. Wow. This, this is the best thing in my studio. <laughs> I got it for Christmas. Yeah, and uh, of course it's, it's a heat gun, so the, the, the air isn't that strong, but the heat is strong. So you don't end up blowing your paint around. 
if it's particularly wet. Yeah. That's, that's my product placement for the day. Now, let me, let me zoom in on this so you can see what happened when I threw that water on it. Look at how much it has broken up those areas of dark. Look at the, look at the blooms and the runs sort of across this building. Mm. <clears throat> right down to the bottom here. I think, I mean, this, I could stop. This is an exciting painting for me. This is not bad. And I have done purely grisaille paintings. Let me see if I, yeah. So this is a painting that is framed. I'm gonna have to pull way out on this one. But this is, a grisaille painting that I did of the meat packing. And it was so, I just fit, I just stopped. It didn't need any color, right? But you can see the amount of splashing within this painting. Mm. Okay. Very good. Let's come back down into this one. Now, this is the real fun part. I mean, throwing the paint is really fun, but now it's, now the payoff. Straighten that up, there we go. Um, now I begin to look at the color. I'm gonna pull my research back out here so we can put it next to each other. Beautiful warm brick here. Up here we have the paint of the, of the uh, subway, elevated subway, which is sort of a blue green. Down here we get some great rust. Look at the rust <laughs> down in here. Right? Then we got our signs. We got our yellow down here. So those are the colors I'm going to put on. I'm going to start with that, with that green. And this is my other palette. I use these, I use these plates constantly. Um, and I'm just going to mix up. I'm going to mix up a bit of a green here with uh, French ultramarine blue and cadmium yellow. Just a sort of a wonderful, I'm gonna actually make it much green, uh, less blue green and more of this. <clears throat> so right on top of all of this mess, I just paint my color. And as you can see, I don't tape my paper down. I don't stretch it because I like to show the deckled edge when I frame my work. <coughs> as I go back into my palette, sometimes I pick up a little more blue. So it's a little different green. And I just mix all of these colors right on the paper. So a little bit of green up on top here. Now the rust. I'll go back to my burnt sienna color here because there's, there's this all this rust which is underneath it. And I'm gonna paint this rust color right over the blue. <clears throat> no fuss, no muss. I'm just painting it just on top of the blue. I am painting it in kind of splotches. So it's not even. I'm picking up a little bit of the paint's gray. That's okay. Mm 
Now back in here, this one, I'm going back to my green. Because this huge I beam that's inside here is actually green. So we're going to see green underneath here. So I'm using my green that I've already used. And I am just painting it right over the Payne's gray. So this sunlight that's poking through here is going to show this green. And then the very bottom of this one goes back to my rust color. Beautiful. I'll zoom in again for you so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm just layering this color right on top of that Payne's gray. Um, let's take a look at, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait on my stoplights here because it's a little wet around there. Let's, let's look at this building itself. And I, there, there's, I want to try to get a mottled color to that. So I'm going to use uh, a color I love. It's called brown ochre, Windsor Newton brown ochre and yellow ochre. Get another brush here. And I'm just going to do the lightest sort of wash of this warm. And here I'm going to be careful. I don't want to, I don't want to go over the windows. So I'm going to paint right up to the windows. Once again, this flat brush, so handy in terms of painting architecture. And as you can see, I'm painting over all of those splashes and smudges right over the shadow. And this is sort of the beauty of this grisaille technique. The shadows automatically appear. I've already painted all the shadows. So I am just painting just this pure color right on top. And how beautifully transparent watercolor is. Everything that's underneath it comes right through. Can't do this with oil. Well, you can do this with oil. <laughs> I think watercolor is more fun. I don't think I paint oil because I'm I'm like ADD. It doesn't dry fast enough. <laughs> and look at this goes right down to the sidewalk. And we have a little bit of brick underneath this. Checking my research here. This yellow brick is here. But on top of this, I'm going to use a little bit of this beautiful, um, what did I call it? Brown ochre. And on this one, I'm just going to paint a little bit of brown ochre. The paints are still very wet, so this is going to blend sort of beautifully. And as you can see, I'm, I'm being smudgy, smudgy, splotchy. Just to put a little more interest into that, I'll zoom in again for you guys, show you what I just painted there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. um, the brick actually around the building itself 
So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually do a little bit stronger brick color. This is such a gorgeous color. It's a color by um, Old Holland. And I don't speak Dutch, but it's Golden Baroque Rood. <laughs> golden Baroque Rood. But it is a beautiful brick color. And there is this building inside here, even though it's in the shadow. There's this beautiful brick color. That's nice. Just a little bit of color underneath here. <clears throat> now my favorite. It's a very particular color. Um, these New York City stoplights and signs. So I have these two stoplights and I have this sign and it's a very particular color and I do it in layers. And what I'm first gonna do is I'm gonna use a bright Indian yellow just to paint underneath it. This front one is in the sun. And it's, pa it's paper that I've left white. So I know it's going to be quite bright. This one back here is a little bit more in shadow. Whoops, Tim. Oh, you lost me again. Hold on. Somebody calling you? Yep, I have lots of friends. <laughs> okay, we're back again. Sorry about that. It's okay. Thanks. And then the sign, this dead end sign. But, you know, I know that this is not, this is not the correct color. So if I zoom in on this, you can see pretty bright yellow, pretty bright yellow. Now my magic secret is this little plate that I have here. This is my taxi cab plate. <laughs> so I have Windsor orange and cad, cad orange, cadmium orange. And this on top of that Indian yellow makes the perfect quality of New York City, I don't know, what would I call it? New York City DMV, no. What do they call the roads here? Potholes. <laughs> but see, by, by layering very lightly this little bit of cadmium orange on top, I get the correct color of those signs. Yeah, that's pretty good. And I'll zoom back in here so you can see what I'm doing here. Messy, isn't it? It's messy. <laughs> but it kind of works. Now, look at as I'm, as I continue to paint here, what I've noticed, and actually I'm gonna wait on that. I've noticed that my shadow here is not dark enough. But I think I want to paint my buildings, my, my lettering first. And this becomes, this becomes the focal point of the, of the painting. Always talking about focal point. Where, do you, where are you having your people look? 
see which brush I want to use here. Yeah, it's a good one. This is this is Windsor red, pretty bright red. Good for signage and very carefully. And I now I need to look at my research here to make sure I'm doing this correctly. Now you're not using a rigger for that. What have you got? No, just I'm, I'm just using a small round. Okay. Now I'm sort of painting this and it's too pink. I really want that to be red. So I'm gonna go into my, I'm gonna check my color and I'm gonna use a color called, um, hmm. <laughs> this is a Windsor Newton, Newton Red Deep. And these are the other little dishes I use. These are little Japanese watercolor dishes that stack up. Where'd you get those? Japan? Uh, Blick. 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 I, I find that this red is a little bit, has a little bit more gusto to it. Yeah, much better. And I'll just very carefully put in my lettering. I learned one thing in the movie business to really state a period of a movie, the graphics are incredibly important. And you can, you can tell a sign from the 70s or a sign from the 40s. So I'm very careful with my graphics. Tim, do you mind um, spelling the name of Paul, the man that you took class with? Is yes, Chingbor, C H I N G dash B O uh, B O R, Chingbor. Okay. Nicest guy, wonderful teacher, Tony. That's that. That's where I met Tony uh, Massey. Antonio Messi. Mm -hmm. So you both learned how to throw paint from Paul Chingbor. Wait, I got to tell you, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Tony Messi came into that class and we were all like, what is he doing here? He, he paints so beautifully. What is he doing in class? And he said, I like the company of artists. Okay, let's see how that's looking. Yeah, that's much, that's, that's exciting. So we're getting some color with that. We also have a green. I'm not sure what they call this, a transfer box. We have a green transfer box down here for mail. The post office box. Yeah, but this isn't, this isn't the blue ones. These are the green ones. Yeah, yeah. painting right over that dark, but just this little bit of color on top. Mm -hmm. yep. and I'm, you know, I'm constantly evaluating. I painted that brick in and it's just too pale. So I'm going to go back in and put another layer of this golden brook rude.
just to punch it up a little bit. I'm also going to go back in and goose up my red because I want to do something for you. I'm putting the red on fairly thick. How's our time? 8.25. So as you can see, I'm putting this on pretty thick. And another little piece of magic. Let me dive into my storage thing here. Hold on. <clears throat> I had my sponges. This is a sponge that I love to use. Um, it's it's like it's the material they use to pack like electronics in. You know, when you get a new stereo or something. Yep. Yep. Right. So this is that sort of dense. Dense fog, uh, dense dense uh, sponge, and I'm going to take my my squirt bottle here, put it on the mist, and I'm just going to very lightly mist that sign that I just did. And once again, I only get one chance to do this, so I'm going to zoom in, zoom in a little bit, and show you what happens here. Mm hmm. And I just, what I'm doing is I'm just smearing that sign. Yep. Very subtle. Okay. And I'm going to go back in and work on that shadow, which is not dark enough. You have a yellow stripe in the street you haven't done either. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Let me give a little bit of a. I can see Marilyn Dernovich laughing. <laughs> Warm this up a little bit so it'll dry. That really didn't smear too much. I needed to put some. Let me try a little bit more here. Putting that color right into this. There we go. Maybe this will be a little bit better. No, nope, it's not, not working tonight. Not smearing the way that I want it to smear. A little bit. Let's put that yellow line in. Now I'll go back to my, I'll go back to my color chart here and find a great bright yellow for that. Do you mind if I listen to this? No. I'm going to You can put your earphones on and hear it, listen to it. Even. Here, I'm going Thank to you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to use my Indian yellow. <clears throat> use one of my big flat brushes. There we go. Yeah, that's pretty good. Take another look at that shadow up here. Go back to my original color, my Payne's gray.
So I'm increasing my shadow. So I'm layering on top my original grise color. That's better. much stronger. Boy, when you started, I didn't think you'd end up with something that looked like this. This is great. Is that a, is that a compliment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it was so... Your initial Payne's gray work was so regular. Structured. So structured. Structured. That's a good one. Good yeah. one, Mike. Okay, let's take a look at this and see what I want to do. You know, part of part of my painting uh, routine, technique, whatever you want to call it, is letting these things sit where I will, I'll put them away actually and then pull them out a few days later or maybe a week later. As I'm painting, I'm not sure that it's, it's strong enough. And even down here, I'm looking at this now, this is not dark enough for me, which is my street. So I'm gonna go back in and just darken the street. I'm constantly looking at the balance, the balance of color and the balance of light and dark value. And uh, I think this is much better. If I darken the street, it gives it a beautiful base. And all of these lines show up much better. Oh, that's much stronger, much stronger. I know I need to balance the, my, my, the top of the painting is very dark and I need to balance it by making the bottom not as dark, but strong enough to sort of hold its own. I think that is, it's getting there. Yeah, much stronger, much stronger base at the bottom. Okay, what am I forgetting? <clears throat> we have a little bit of color over here.
And in the window, there's a whole bunch of different stuff, but it is the signage. And I'm just going to suggest a little bit of color in this window. Not bad. I'm now looking at the, the weight of that initial brick that I put in there. And I think it needs to be, let's see, where's my, there we go. Needs to have a little bit more oomph, this side. So I'm gonna go in and put in another layer right on top of everything of this yellow ochre. Yes. Yes, that's nice. And I'll just do half of it. it breaks up the wall a little more nicely. And a little bit more of this brown ochre, just in places. Now it seems very bold right now. Let's see what happens when it all dries. Okay, this is this is getting to be a good place. Now, let me put it next to, let me clean up my mess here. Let me put it next to my research. So we can sort of balance it and see immediately, I see that my green up here is not strong enough. I need a much stronger green. And this I can just put on. That's better. Yeah, a little bit stronger up there. Better. Now I'm looking, it's funny, I'm looking at the screen and the color seems to be a little bit more intense. The, the yellow seems to have really intensified a bit. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a clean cloth. I'm just gonna put a little bit of water on top and just lift. And that will just, just take the edge off what I just painted. I'm not scrubbing, I'm just pressing. And that, that gets to be a little bit better balance, I think. Let me take this out of the plastic. I put my research in plastic sleeves. Oh, sorry. We're back. There we go. Okay, interesting. I've shifted color a bit. 
I have made it a little bit in some places bolder. Now I'm still looking at the shadow and I think it could be even darker still. Oh, that's better. Just half of it, not the other half. I can see that the sunlight is sort of stronger on this, more oblique on this. So the shadows are actually different there. And that makes a little, that gives it a little bit more interest, I think. The one thing that I remember from Paul Ching Boer is he would come around as we were painting and he would take away our research. He would take away the photograph and he would say, what does the painting say? Don't tell me what the research says. Tell me what the painting says. And I think that's an important, important lesson that I learned from him to really look at the strength of the painting itself without being distracted by what the research is saying. For this, I'm gonna show you both, but being able to see what this painting is gonna say is most important. Okay, I think I'm pretty close to finishing. Does anyone have any any questions for me? How about the a very bright area underneath the mailbox? Ah. <laughs> there is a bit of shadow there, thank you. Was that drawing your eye? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have caught it eventually. That's better. We have a lot of teachers watching this. Oh. <laughs> now I'm, now I'm, proud. I'm, I'm glad you didn't tell me that at the beginning. <laughs> particularly nervous. Yeah. <clears throat> so congratulations on getting into the American Watercolor Society show. Yeah, it's always a crapshoot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> How many folks uh, apply to the AWS? Oh, I, I did. Know. Yeah. You did, um, Mike? Or? I did, yeah. Didn't yeah. get anywhere. We chose, I think, 128 paintings out of little under 1,000 submissions. Wow. <laughs> the people from NIFUS that I know of that got in are Catherine O'Neill and Kathleen Giles. Yes. yes. Superb painters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, as, as secretary of the AWS, I sit and watch all that happen. I don't, I don't judge on any of the paintings. I'm not a judge, but I'm there to sort of take down the, uh, the results as the recording secretary. And it's always shocking to me uh, what, um, what judges see with that. And we're looking in your studio right now. You're sitting in your studio? I, I'm sitting in my studio slash living room. <laughs> I've, taken, <laughs> I've taken the best room of the house and I've turned it into my studio. Um, and I don't have a living room, but I spend all day in here. It's like, you know, the light is beautiful. The size is beautiful. I just don't invite people over. <laughs> Do you have a, you said, you showed me a photo earlier of the painting that you did that got into the AWS. Could you yes. show us? Sure. This is a painting of the old police headquarters down on Center Street, just, just to the west of um, Chinatown, Little Italy. It's in sort of that no man's land that isn't Soho uh, it's that weird sort of industrial area right in the center of Manhattan. But this beautiful Beaux-Arts building sits among all these warehouses. I remember um, Mike asked you if you use white and it looks to me like this is maybe the, an area where you did at the, at the um, use white you know, for it. Mike did ask that and let me, let me pull something up where I've actually used white much stronger. Let me see if I can find something here. Hold on, hold on a sec.
Indeed. Mike, I'm not sure what I have here. Um, <laughs> okay, this is this is a big painting, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to clear out a little bit here. So I think I'll your demo you. is fabulous. Right? People agree. Let's, let, let's see how it dries here now. <laughs> okay. This is a big one, so I'll try to drag it in here. Okay. But I'm going to have to zoom way out. Oh. See how we can do here. Okay. There, you see my entire table now. Ah, there you go. So this is one of my larger paintings. Um, so this is, uh, let me zoom out even more. here. Yeah, that's better. So this is my 40 by 26 inch paper. What is it mounted on? I, I just have it on a piece of foam core. Okay. Hold on a second. There we go. Now, Mike, I'm going to show you where I used white, and I'm going to zoom in here. See the smoke? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's white paint on top of it. Ah. Is it gouache or you use a white watercolor? Um, believe it or not, I use uh, gouache, white gouache. The white watercolor, either it be titanium or the Chinese white, isn't strong enough right. to get that sense of smoke. But Mike, that's that's what I use in terms of of um, white on top of a painting. Uh huh. So, so thank you. Wonderful smoke you see in Manhattan that I just love. Yeah, sure. So this is another painting that I kind of stopped at the grisaille lot level. And let me see if I can fit it on my table here. I'm making a mess. Um, but I just, I just did the two colors and then I stopped. So this isn't pure grisaille. It has a little bit of the warmth, but it's really a monochromatic painting. Do that. And you, you splattered that quite a bit, I guess. Lots of splatters, yeah. And you know, I gotta tell you this, the splatter technique works so much better on a large painting. Let me zoom back in here. There we go. Okay. Back to here. Could you show us that? Do you ever do you ever call it no tan, that black and white value sketch that you did? Yeah. It's so it, the paint the final painting is so different from I mean, it's not, it's different and yet it's the same. Right, yeah. it's the shapes that I was looking for, but as you can see, the center I didn't make as dark, but in the value, I try to really push it to see how far I can go with the value. And I do this a lot. Let me, let me pull out a couple more of those. Your painting glows. Oh boy. Okay. I gotta dig into my into my files. So these are just some of the other value sketches that I've done. Tim, are these all basically New York City? Oh yeah. So here's- and Did you live there or do you just go in and out? Yeah, I, I've lived in New York on and off three or four times. I moved out to Jersey City uh, because I got a bigger apartment. So this right, is the right. value sketch of, this, of the painting you just saw. Yeah. Okay. So it's fun to sort of explore all these different values first. Wow. And, and you kind of can't even tell what you're looking at here, but you're looking down a street. 
And I wanted to show you something particular. I had mentioned Edward Hopper. So this is an Edward Hopper, one of his very first preliminary sketches for Nighthawks. Nighthawks, yeah. Isn't that fabulous? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. then, and then after that, he went in and did this. Oh boy. Here's his value sketch. For not, this was not very large. It was actually quite small. Wow. Is that the same size as the original? Or is it larger? Yes, yes, yes. It is about eight and a half by 11. Okay. And then of course, the, the finished painting we all know and love. Sure. From Chicago. But I love the fact that he explored value so beautifully here. And here he used it on buff paper with a little bit of white, a little bit of uh, graphite, really kind of working out the painting before he finished the painting. Can I ask you on a different related subject? There's been a yep. lot of um, experimenting with, with no glass um, sealing Yes, and ways of sealing and different ways of mounting watercolors yeah. on. What what is your thinking about that? Well, the painting I showed you at the beginning. This is how I show my work. Zoom out again here. So this is uh, a floater frame. The there is no glass. But what I've done is I've waxed my paper. I've waxed my watercolor paper with- When you're finished. Yep, the last yeah. thing I do. Now this one, if you notice, I mounted it on hard board on a panel. So let me zoom into a corner here so you can see what I'm talking about. So I've mounted it on this panel. And what I found is it's a little bit more a contemporary way to present my watercolors. And I, I hate glass. I hate plexi, the reflection. It kind of makes it all kind of old and stodgy, but this yep. way is a way that I can present my work without anything in front of it. So once again, I what I put on it is a cold wax medium, which is a, a wax, I just put wax on top of it and it seals completely. Right? Okay. David, do you want to say anything? <laughs> you're muted. Hey, David, have you explored this? David Gardner. Yeah, you're, you're on mute. Unmute yourself, David. No, you're still muted, David. Doesn't know how <laughs> Frust Zoom frustration here. <laughs> you don't want that little red guy next to your name. So down in the lower there you there go. Go. okay all right so yeah i i'm uh, uh exploring different ways of presenting work without the uh without glass yeah um or plexi it it you know we as watercolorists tend to be the uh, red-haired stepchildren of the art world when it comes to comparisons with oil and acrylic and um I, people immediately can tell it's a watercolor uh, because of the glass and plexi. Yes. And um, I, I think if um, there are just so many ways now to protect your, your work yes. uh, with, with spray, with brush, with wax yep. um, mediums that uh, put us on equal footing with some of these uh, other uh, mediums and yes. uh, I, I I think we should be open to those kinds of changes and experimentation. Yeah. Um, that's what art is about: is creative uh, thinking and 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 change and evolution. Um, and I I think the watercolor world is overdue for that kind of uh, change and development. Yeah. Now I use wax but there was just an exhibit in New York called Broken Glass. And yeah. it was actually sponsored by the Golden Company. And they had sealed all of their watercolors mounted on board with, um, with an acrylic seal, mm -hmm. a flat acrylic seal, beautiful. 
beautiful way to present these. Um, so yes, you're right. Sprays, we have sprays. If you get into a gloss, it'll, it'll embolden your watercolors. Your watercolors will appear brighter and mm -hmm. deeper if you use a gloss. Um, that I, I, I tend to stick away from that. It makes it look a little plasticky. I like the matte finish, so I tend to stay with matte. And the wax that I put on stays matte. I'm surprised that the wax doesn't pull up the watercolor. No, it's a, it's a um, petroleum-based product, so it's not going to touch the watercolor. What, the what problem do you put with, it on with? I'm sorry? What do you put it on with? Uh, a palette knife. A two inch or three inch palette knife. Yeah. It's, it's a consistency of like shoe polish. I use particularly something called Dorland's, Dorland's cold wax medium. And I literally scrape it on, scrape, scrape, scrape the, the so you don't even see the, the wax. Uh, and since it's petroleum based, it won't, won't touch the watercolor. I've had a little bad luck if I've tried some of the water based um, seals because the water will sometimes pick up the darker watercolor and smear it. Now, I don't think, <laughs> I don't know if you could tell on my paintings, but that's something you may want to stay away from. Uh, David also mentioned they have some beautiful sprays out there, which will also not smear watercolor since it's just sprayed on top of it and protects it. When, could you say how many, like what percentage of the, sh the paintings that were accepted into the AWS have Glass and plexi, is it? Everything, 100%. It's all the, glass and plexi. Yes, because the paintings are moved around so much and they go on tour, it's too dangerous to have not, un, non, unprotected paintings. So okay. we've made the rule, it's sort of like, yeah, we know we would love to have paintings without plexiglass, but everything must be plexi to protect the paintings. Okay. Yeah, and that's a purely practical, not an aesthetic choice. Well, it's an interesting discussion. Yeah. But Although, you know, when I put work into the Allied Arts, Allied Artists of America, also at the Salma Gandhi Club, I'll put in my un, unglazed work. Because basically I bring it in, I put it on the wall and then I take it off the wall. So I know that it's not being moved. Now, and after the cold wax has dried, do you go back and buff it 24 to 48 hours later? No, if you buff it, it's gonna shine up like a shoe. Okay. Okay. Now that might be a choice that, that you'd like to do, but I find on the textured watercolor paper, it doesn't buff up very well because okay. of the texture of the paper. But it's, but it's interesting, explore, explore using this stuff. Let me, um, let me dig out some of this just to show you. <laughs> the secret living room panel. Yeah, I'm loving, loving the living room. <laughs> yeah, Ikea, Ikea. Okay, here's, here's my Dorland's cold wax, wax medium. Yeah. Okay, and as you can see, it's like, it has the consistency of uh, shoe polish, right? Uh, it's petroleum based, and this is what I use to apply it. Very soft putty knife. Okay. Uh. Very soft, not the metal ones. You don't want to damage your paper. And I literally just put it on and just scrape it right across. Wow. And you and you're literally picking up all of it. You can you cannot you cannot detect a layer on top. Some of the acrylics are a little bit thick. You can tell it's acrylic on top. The wax doesn't. Wow. So I think we're at we're at nine o'clock. Anyone have any other questions? This has been great. No, no, I just have to say this has been more than great. It's been awesome. I, I, I love to watch, I, we all love to watch other painters, yeah. but I learned so much. I, I was totally unaware of this wax that you could put on top instead of glass. Terrific, terrific show. Thank you. Very good, Mike. Thank you very much. And Tim, we're going to, since this has been recorded, I'm going to post it on our YouTube channel, the NIFLIS YouTube channel tomorrow. Okay. And um, I took a couple of photo screenshot photos, but if you could email me a picture of your painting. Yeah, you let me do that for you. That would yeah. be great. Thank you. It's, it's very, it's very, um, I need to press it tonight. So I'll make it flat tonight. Okay. Can you press it? Okay. I spray the back with my water. 
Yeah. Where's my water squirter? Wherever it went. Um, I missed, I it. missed it. And yeah. then I'll and then I'll put a piece of clean paper on top of it. And then a ton of books. Okay. So you don't I'll, actually iron it then. I, I do. I do iron it. You iron the back of it. Um, but I find that the little bit of water and books uh, is actually a better flat. Okay. By the way, warning, you'll ruin your iron if you iron paper. So yeah. I use an old iron. You literally scrape the Teflon off the iron surface. Oh, I, uh, I put my so If you have a good iron, don't use it on your paintings. <laughs> You'll put, ruin your iron. I put sheets both sides so that it doesn't get. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. That's a good way to do it, of course, too. Yeah. Tim, how do you mount these on a background? Um, I. Well, I, once again, I don't use water-based glue. Believe it or not, I use rubber cement. They really? now have archival rubber cement. Wow. And you use it just the way you did in school. You paint both surfaces. Right. And then you put it down. I press it down and weight it. And whatever little glue comes off the side, you just roll it up. Wow. So rubber cement, but it's archival rubber cement. So it's pH yeah. balanced rubber cement aside from the usual school rubber cement. So I've got to be very careful in terms of archival when I mount my paintings and sell them. And once again, I'm, I'm selling paintings. So I'm always kind of in the marketing thing. And I found that mounting them on board on panels is a nice way to present a watercolor. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> silent. Speechless. There's a, there's We're speechless. There's a uh, lot, yes. Just hey, thank you, everyone. Yeah, um, thank you very much. And I, I, I've got to ask, what is the Niagara frontier? <laughs> well, when would it, where would it start? Probably Brockport? From Brockport oh, there we go. So, uh, so that whole area. Along Lake, Lake Ontario, Niagara County, and then Beautiful. down all the way down to Chautauqua County. And yeah, I, I like the frontier. It, it gives it a good wait. <laughs> We have okay. Canadian members too. Yeah, we do. Toronto we do. and I. I got to tell you, it's so important to have these watercolor societies. It's so important to have a tribe of fellow artists that you can you can talk to or at least meet them occasionally, and show kindred words. spirits. Yep. Kindred spirits. Yep. Exactly. Very important. Right. Uh, we agree. Anybody else want to say anything in closing? Very inventive work, and I, I really uh, admire the fact that you, you and your your mentors are pushing the envelope. Got Great, it. it's 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 really wonderful to see. Thank you very much. You know, my my, you can email me through my website if you have any other questions. Don't hesitate to contact me. Um, things you missed tonight, give me a, and once again through my website you can uh, email me. Well, there, there may be, I'm not exactly sure how many people watching tonight, 40-ish, somewhere yeah. in that ballpark, yeah. but there will be literally thousands who will look at the uh, YouTube. Uh-oh. We keep track of that. <laughs> that. That makes me nervous. <laughs> you don't need Why, to you won't there. even be there. You can tell, you can, you can link any anybody you want, if you want to link on Facebook or to Instagram to this video once it's up. We'd love to have all your friends watch it too. Thanks everyone. The French it was a wonderful demo. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.